Hey everybody, welcome to Atheist Experience Live. It's February 17th, 2013. I'm Matt Dillahoney, that's Martin Wagner. We're here to talk to people. It's a live call and television program out of Austin, Texas. And we'll have the number up. Uh, actually, all the lines are already full, but we'll get the number up uh, again soon anyway. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm uh, good, I'm crazy busy, lots of- Yes, me like too. 16 hours, 12, 16 hour so, days, whatever, yeah. at work. But, but that uh, doesn't matter, because we're here to talk about uh, God stuff. We are. Uh, and other stuff. But mostly God stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, people ask several times, well, why do you guys do this? Well, mm. it's a way to engage in conversation. And, and there's enough religious programming on TV that there ought to at least be one atheist show out there somewhere. True. And it's also all the money and sex. Yes, yes. The, you know, the groupies. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, but basically, we, we like having conversations. We want to know what people believe and why. And yes, that maybe, is the biggest reason. Maybe we agree. Maybe we don't. Um, before we actually get started, since... Uh, we already have full lines and you don't have a topic and I want to get right to calls. Uh, there's an yeah. email that came in last night that I thought I'd just read and reply to uh, on the show because I don't have enough time to actually answer all the email that comes in. So, yeah. Matt, I've noticed you're extremely polite to Christians during debates. Uh, she's watched videos of debates I've done online. And, um, why do you do this when in fact they think you're a piece of shit? I suggest you watch Christopher Hitchens' debates and learn from him. He gave them no respect, which is actually what any atheist should do. They do think we're going to hell. I mean, come on, quit being timid. Uh, so first of all, uh, <laughs> the people that I've actually had debates with don't tend to think that I'm a piece of shit. They don't dislike me. I get along with most of them. I could probably call you know, any of them right now and say, hey, let's have you know, another debate, another conversation, with perhaps one exception. Um, the other thing is that it's about addressing ideas and not people. I don't know what it is. I've seen Hitchens' debates, by the way, and I, I don't... Yeah. Uh, He's I not don't, out there being rude. I don't rude agree or... with you that he gave them no respect. I think he, yeah. he gave no respect to their beliefs, and he didn't, but he wasn't out there as a raving, right. screaming, uh, you know, name-calling buffoon. Hitchens could um, eviscerate you in the calmest voice possible. He had that yeah. wonderful voice. But, he know, didn't need to. not necessarily to. saying, yeah, yeah it's timid. But the other yeah. thing is that I'm, I'm out there to address ideas and I care how those debates are perceived by believers. And actually, I'd rather uh, be engaging uh, an audience full of believers than atheists. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, I don't need to preach to the choir, I guess. Right. Um, so, you know, well, thanks for that. And I will continue to work on uh, getting better in debates. I do not think that your suggestions would actually make me better uh, in debates or, or have a better result. So Yes, and you're well, probably the first person in the history of the show who's ever attached the adjective timid to Matt. Well, yeah. uh, most of the letters you get are like, God, Matt's really cranky. To yeah, you're, just, you're a raging yeah. ass. What's wrong with you? And the yeah, thing is, so, is that, uh, But this, that, that, that woman just really does not know what the purpose of these debates are A for, lot of the right? frustration, though, is in public debates, big, big public debates in, at a university or whatever, that, you know, I've done quite a few of them. Um, they're a structured format. They're, they are about addressing ideas. They are about having, uh, you know, an, an actual debate. And one of the things that I've tried to do in the more recent debates is I hate the joint press, con uh, press release uh, format where I get up and say my thing, they get up and say their thing, I get up and say what I want. And the, you know, you just quick little back and forth, no interaction. And forensic And groups. then yeah. we're done. I mean, we could have just, you know, phoned it in if that's what we're going to do. And so... I've tried to have more direct questioning between the participants, mm -hmm. uh, which I think makes it more conversational and potentially more beneficial rather than sitting there waiting for five minutes and trying to take as many notes on as many things as they got wrong as possible and then addressing them all in a shorter mm -hmm. amount of time. Yeah. Uh, lots of problems with debates, but... <clears throat> Uh, that, was an, that was an advantage of the forensic debate structure that... Uh, led to the Gish Gallop, right? The, yeah. I mean, it, it, it allowed the Gish Gallop to be this thing that was developed as, you know, I'm going to spout 20 falsehoods 
in a rapid fire pace, and yeah. then you are now going to be in a defensive position of having to refute every single one of them in less time, while I sit here, you know, looking smug. Yeah. And that's so. That's actually uh, um, the, the the formal forensic style of debate has actually been bad, I think, for publicly addressing these ideas and actually having meaningful conversations about them. So yep. sometimes, and that's why things are a little bit different on the show. Which, um, okay. qu quite frankly, I'm often more uh, irritated than I'd like to be. And a lot of it has to do, as I've said before, uh, I'm talking about Martin, but a lot of it has to do with uh, the problems with the phones, which you know. It, it, some of it's got to do with cell phones, some of it's got to yeah. do with, with this box, you can't always hear each other, there's issues, and there's somebody who emailed to talk about whether or not, once again, we should interrupt. And so I'll explain that again, um, and then we'll get right to calls, and that is, um, I realize that in normal conversations and stuff, it's generally considered rude to interrupt, but it's a necessity in this format, because I learned from the past that someone will begin an argument with a flawed premise mm -hmm. and then they will speak for a couple of minutes to build up their entire argument and then when you want to go back to that flawed premise at the beginning they've now put forward an entire argument based on something that's either false or needs better definition and, and clarification and when you go back to it you spend a lot of times running in circles on that where well that's not what I said or that's not what I meant or well here let me say it this way and then go on and construct another argument and now you you just building yeah. up what appears to be a wealth of information that is all really based on nothing. And so I will interrupt, um, because I, I think, first of all, direct questions need to be answered directly. Yeah. You know, I don't know what you mean by that, please tell me, and if you duck and dodge, well, then you're no, you've are no you divorced yourself from the conversation. And I think that that was a problem that, in, in a lot of ways, uh, impacted your the, the debate you had several you know uh, episodes ago with Matt Slick, where he bogged the whole thing down on trying to uh, argue this a semantic point about uh, the difference between uh, term A and term B. Um, what it was, what it, real things or uh, conceptual things, and this sort of, and it, it came down to that. And uh, he, he, he was able to really derail the conversation, I think, by focusing on that point. Yeah, I think there were yeah. other problems with that yeah. particular but that was discussion. A, that was a big one, though. And they're, um, they're, they have mostly to do with the way Matt's brain works. Yeah, <laughs> there's that. Uh, <coughs> but also, you know, when you consider what, what uh, you see on most mainstream media, or uh, usually radio is where you tend to find the live call-in format, not so yeah. much television, but... Uh, what with everything that, uh, you know, we're imperfect and we learn as we go and we've been doing this 15 years and we're still going to work on making it better. But uh, for any, any program that you find out there that has a live calling format, I think that our show is among the best for allowing in-depth conversation to oh, go yeah. on. You go on a, a radio a show, you've got 30 seconds. Yeah, meaningful exchange of ideas. And it's not this soundbite thing, da 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 and, and uh, you know, you, you ask a question and the you know, host gets in a cute little quip and... You know, and, and this happens with like, politics and all kinds of things, you know, whatever. I think our show is, is, is still uh, one of the best for how we do it. Even when we get it wrong, I think we do it better than most. Well, let's get to calls so we yeah. can do it all wrong. Yes, indeed. We're going to be very rude today. So you got Frank and Scranton. How you doing? Hi, guys. How you doing? We're Pretty well. Good. good. Mr. Dillahoney, uh, Cowboy oh. Wagner. AppCats is awesome, by the way. Thank you. I'd like to... Awesome. And I'd just like to say, you guys don't do it right most of the time. You guys do it right all the time. Oh, okay. please. Oh, you. <laughs> really? I mean, I'm being honest. Okay, but anyway, I don't want to take up any more time with uh, praise and flattery, because even though it's well-deserved here, <laughs> certain scientific theories, well-respected by the scientific community, by the way, mm -hmm. are just as valid as certain established religions. For example, string theory. Well, okay, first mm -hmm. of all, um, I think string theory is mislabeled as a theory. Um, I don't, I don't, my understanding of it is that I don't think it qualifies as an actual theory yet. Um, I think they've kind of co-opted that term a little bit. Um, and I, I don't even know what my position is on it, if any, so. Yeah. Okay, but, 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 but we know you're that it's familiar with, with it a little bit, like this uh, ten dimensions of space, one dimension of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm passingly familiar. I don't know what that has to do with anything, yeah. but and then the oh, best okay. the, the best that I could say about it is that I know that a great many people in the field of physics uh, reject it outright too. So, so it's not something that has a universal scientific support, to say the very least. So, the, so. The, the 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 note here next to your name is that the host and audience should be just as skeptical of certain scientific claims as they are of certain theological claims. Exactly. And we are. So yes, we agree with that. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, we, what about the belief that our galaxy contains, as uh, Carl Sagan used to say, 100 billion stars? Um, 
I mean, doesn't that sound just as rounded off as, like, say... Oh, well, it's not meant to, it's, yeah. it's yeah. Not meant to be an actual... It's not like there could... It's, it's an estimate. He's, he's saying there's not $100 billion in four. It's yeah. not meant to be an exact number. When we say that the universe is, or the, the Earth's four and a half billion years old and the universe is 13.7 billion years old, that doesn't, you, this reminds me of the, of the old joke. This, this guy's given a tour of a museum and it's an older, older gentleman and he's walking people around and they get to a dinosaur and somebody says, hey, how old are, are, are those bones? And he says, well, they're 63 million years, four, or 63 million, 14 years and five weeks. And they're like, how did, you, how did you date that like that? Well, I've been here 14 years and five weeks, and they told me it was 63 million years old when I worked here. That's, <laughs> when we say there's 100 billion stars in the galaxy, of course we're giving an estimate. It's not like we've actually counted them. Yeah. Okay, but is, is the distance from the Earth to the sun an estimate as uh, legitimate as the 100 billion stars? It, 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 it is. It is around. It, it's it's miles. around 93 million miles. Yeah. Because there's but a thing I mean, called uh, there's a thing called perihelion and aphelion, where you know, the the Earth's orbit around the sun is an ellipse, right? We yeah. know that. So there are times when the Earth is closer to the sun than farther away, and so the 93 million mile figure is designed to be sort of an average. It's a mean distance, and and it's just there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's that's very common. People do that all the time. You do average numbers just because they're easy to reference. Um, but, uh, you know, if you know, look it up on just Wikipedia, it'll tell you, you know, about, uh, you know, the, the Earth's, the distance from the Earth to the Sun and uh, astronomical units and, um, I think and what they mean and how they're, how they're done. And so, yeah, but yeah, there's, there's all kinds of shorthand, but, but the people who, who come up with these figures know this and they're very clear about that these are estimated figures. Would well, you say that Wikipedia is a, a valid source, though? Well, it's, uh, you know, it's, if the, for, if it's, for general use. It's, if it has references that, that yeah. you can go out and look further. I, I'm not, see, your point was originally about, what, you know, we should be skeptical of scientific claims as well. We are. But what, what you're objecting to are things that uh, don't make any sense. Yeah, they're very hair-splitting details about things. And yeah, they, it's not like I have this, uh, this firm belief that there's exactly 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, that's not... That's not it at all. It, there seems to be like a gross conceptual error here. Yeah. Oh, okay, because I said I am a theist, but I'm more so of, a, uh, you know, uh, you say free thinkers, but are free thinkers only people who think just like you? No. 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 Well, there are disagreements Why? amongst free thinkers. I don't oh, know. Oh, well, believe would... me, I know a lot of free thinkers that I do not see eye to eye on on a great many, many things. But you know what? That's what it means to be a free thinker is that you think for yourself about issues. And you know, whatever it is that uh, is meaningful to you. You right, form your own ideas. Right. Exactly. Now, those ideas may be good or they may be bad. They may be founded on the solid facts or they may be founded on um, informed opinion or uninformed opinion. But, but, but know, setting, as, setting aside free thinking and just talking about, for example, skepticism, I, I have very specific views about skepticism. Um, and that doesn't mean that everybody who identifies as a skeptic necessarily agrees. I, I for one, uh, hold the view that skepticism necessarily leads to atheism. And I think I can, I can demonstrate that. And that there are a number of, athe a number of skeptics who, who don't think that. And, and it baffles me. And I'd love to you know, ha have a conversation as to why they think that is, because somebody is misusing terms. Because to me, the proper application of skepticism does lead to positions. In the same way that a, isn't a theist as valid as, let's say, a Gnostic atheist, because I went to your Iron Cherry, it's an excellent site, and it talks about the difference between a agnostic atheist and a Gnostic atheist. And wouldn't it's, it's a Gnostic ag agnostic. atheist be just as, um, uh, I don't want to say foolish, but as a theist? Potentially. It depends on your definition of knowledge. Um, and that's, you know, it, 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 we're, we're like way out in left field here. But... Um, when it comes to isn't a theist just as valid, I, I mean, that, everything about the terminology and everything about what you're communicating is just like a half step off. The theism is this position that a God exists. And I, my, my position is that um, a critical examination of the evidence has not provided us with sufficient evidence to justify that belief. Therefore, you cannot be rationally justified if you're a theist. Unless, I mean, you, you would need to be able to demonstrate some evidence that nobody's been able to demonstrate. Well, so, would somebody also be uh, a lacking sufficient evidence to be a Gnostic, period? Whether they be a Gnostic theist Atheist. As I said, that that depends entirely on what you mean by w what what the definition of knowledge is, and it's not 
I, 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 it's not even a concern. Oh, I, don't, so I, I, don't, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't really care whether or not somebody claims to know something. What I care is whether or not they claim to believe it, because we don't wait until we have knowledge to act. We act in accordance with our beliefs. And so be knowledge is a subset of belief. It, in, in some philosophical circles, it's been defined as justified true belief. I have my objections to that one. Um, I've run with the definition where um, you can believe things to varying degrees of certainty. And knowledge, in a colloquial sense, is belief to such a high degree of certainty that it would be worldview altering to discover that it's wrong. But I don't care if you say you know. I mean, if you say you know something, all you've really told me is, I really, 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 really believe this. And all I care about is whether or not you actually believe it and whether or not that belief is justified. Well, I'm surprised in the scientific community that certain people create their own definition of the word nothing, like Lawrence Krauss, for example, whom you recommended. It's, 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 it's not him creating his own definition of nothing. The fact is that in different circles, words have been used in different ways. You, you look, have you looked in a dictionary and seen like number one, number two, number three, number four? Those are different usages of a term. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. It's not like somebody invented this. Um, For example, the, the, the word right, theory, right. one objection that you will hear uh, anti-evolutionists and creationists make to, uh, to evolution is they will say, yes, but it's only a theory. And of course, what they misunderstand is that in everyday life, for example, theory, if you're just using it in a colloquial sense, means I have a th feeling about something, or I'm just guessing here, but, dot, dot, dot. But in the scientific world, they don't use theory in, in that. That's not what theory means. A theory in, in, in science is, is not a word you get to call your idea until you can back it up with such a solid body of evidence that your, your, if your peers review your work, uh, and they're able independently to come to the same conclusions that you are. And, and so in science, a theory has to be very, a very, very solidly supported, evidentially supported idea, which is much, much different than, you know, um, you know, if you and I were just talking and say, you know, I have a theory about why this, you know, my favorite, you know, baseball team stuck this season or why, you know, it's, it's, it's different from I'm just guessing in science. But, so it's the same yeah. thing as I understand in, in the world of physics, for example, Nothing doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as when you and I as laymen talk about nothing and, and the mathematical application of nothing that Lawrence Krauss is applying is something that is understood in physics and not just a thing that he's pulling out of his hat. And it, and it doesn't matter at all because words serve a purpose. They are tools to convey meaning. And you can make up whatever word you want or you can use whatever word you want as long as you are clear about what you mean in that context. And so it's not that physicists are just running around co-opting nothing or changing the meaning of nothing. Thing. They could have. They could have used any number of words, um, as long as you, the communication is effective. And when they're communicating with peers, it is. It's when you get outside of the localized jargon that people tend to get confused about those things. Uh, of course, but don't you think that maybe debates would run smoother if everybody agreed on semantics and terminology right from the get-go? Of course, I mean, you encourage but that, right? of of course, but the. This isn't about debates. This isn't about the public communication of information. This is about people doing work in a particular field and having a particular usage for a term. There's no, not, not confusion, really, amongst them. And if they're, and if they're uh, in order to persuade uh, an uninformed public about their ideas, if, you, if for example, if you're a physic, physicist and you want to convey your ideas to a lay public who doesn't have the math, doesn't have the background to understand what you're talking about, if you, mm -hmm. if you launch into all of your professional jargon and shop talk, mm -hmm. then uh, you as the physicist, if you clearly convey you know, what I mean, but when I'm saying this, here's what I mean. When I'm saying that, here's what I mean. Here's what I'm referring to. And you can make that understood by your audience, then that's really all you need to do. Right. Yeah, well, yippee-ki-yay, I understand that 100%. Okay, but, so what's the problem? But nobody has to accept something that hasn't been observed. Would you agree with that? That nobody has, has uh, okay, see, that here's, an, here's another thing, Frank, where what you're saying is like a half a step uh, out in left field, and I don't mean that as an insult. Okay. Nobody, nobody has to accept anything ever. There's no requirement that you accept anything under any conditions. So okay, when okay, when you okay, yes. and so when you say nobody has to accept anything that that hasn't been observed, nobody has to accept anything that has been observed either. So okay, I mean, yes. okay, sure. So oh. when we're talking about this, I, I want to get to what you. I want to, and there's other callers waiting too. But I wanted to get to what your actual objection is because you're kind of like half a step outside of, of of what we're talking about at almost every turn. But accepting evolution. 
question would be an argument from authority, wouldn't it? No. no. Because it's never been observed. I mean... Yes, it has. Actually, it has. We're talking about the uh, Planck wall. I mean, going back to the Planck wall, except that's the Planck that's okay. theoretical, talk, theoretical physics, just like string theory. And that has First, nothing to do with evolutionary biology. Yeah. The, the, See, you're, you're now conflating different fields and different ideas in science. Yeah, it's just really kind of bizarre yeah. because now you're, you're talking about, as far as I can tell, I think you're talking about Planck time. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, to 10 to the negative 43 seconds, exactly. It, w which doesn't have anything to do with evolution of the observation. That is the limit to which we can go back to the origins of the universe. Yeah. And that's, um, an, entire, that's an entire... Which has nothing topic. to do with evolution. Evolution, you're talking about cosmology now. You've jumped sciences and you didn't even realize it. Mm -hmm. See, it's I, just, uh, it's just, but see, I, I, I think it would make their terminology more clear, and it would be more easier for lay people to grasp. No, it's, it's, it's not about it being unclear, it's about being uninformed. I have no confusion about the difference between cosmology and evolution. Evolution has nothing to do with the origin of the universe. Evolution is the biological si the science of the diversity of life after life has arisen, which is still long after we, we've left the origin of the universe. Well, then what would you consider abiogenesis? Is it a term of cosmology? Abi abiogenesis is the, yes. is the abiogenesis is the label for life arising from non-living matter, which is something that is required prior to evolution, but it also has nothing to do with cosmology and the origins of the universe. The origin of the universe, cosmology, the origins of life, biogenesis, abiogenesis, the evolution of life after it's arisen, Evolution, really simple. Yeah, there, there, there are a lot of different fields here you're conflating, and I think that um, uh, you, a lot of your problems uh, that you're, you're trying to express to us here have to do with just being confused about you know exactly the subjects you're talking about and what each one refers to, what each one means, you know, what each idea, the, you know, the realm of human knowledge that each one explores. And so because you have these uh, kind of confusions and conflations going on, you're, and it's, you're unsure it's, about, uh, you know, the, that, this is what's led to your whole line of questions. Yeah, and it's funny because... But some that's scientists, all. when you say equally, because there's some scientists who say that there was something before the Big Bang, and then some say there wasn't because there was no time. I mean, it's just so confused. Scientists are... I mean, it's just you're, you're talking. You're talking about an area where we don't have an explanation, yeah. and it may be nonsensical to talk about before the Big Bang. Well, yeah. See, there, see, here's nonsensical, uh, Frank. Nonsensical, but isn't that a way of avoiding the question? To no. say it's nonsensical. No, to say we don't know, we don't currently have a sufficient understanding of the, of that, is not a way of avoiding the question. And the way it's a way of avoiding a false answer. Yeah, and the way in which scientists do resolve the questions for which we don't have answers is they argue things out. They study their fields. They uh, they look at evidence. Uh, some will reach, uh, you know, a scientist A will reach one conclusion. Scientist B will reach another. Uh, they they will they will debate. They will argue. They will discuss. They will write papers. They will submit them to journals. They'll get published or rejected, and then a whole new round of debate. You know, this is how this is how science. Uh, this is the self-correcting uh, process of the scientific method that helps. Facts be understood. Science, science so. doesn't make claims about truth. It's not yeah. about discovering truth. It's about gaining an understanding, the best possible understanding of reality based on the available evidence. And it's not that's it. And it's not uh, you know citing scientific um, ideas as uh, is not an argument from authority because a scientific idea is not accepted simply because Mr. Prominent Scientist says this is true. Yeah, it's accepted Mr. based on the weight of the evidence. Right. Mr. Well, Prominent Scientist has to show his work, and his work has to hold up. Otherwise, well, it will, his well, ideas will not be accepted, no matter how big of an authority he may be in his field. Authority, uh, authorities in scientific fields can still be wrong. They know this. Their peers know this. And the whole, and, and the whole method, uh, methodology of science. And, and, I'll, and, and I'll, let, I'll let you get to this. I just want to point out one quick thing. The fallacy of appeal to an authority is appealing to an authority that's not an actual authority. If you're citing actual authorities, recognizing expertise, that's not a fallacy. Doesn't mean they can't be wrong, but it's not a fallacy. Go ahead. Okay, all I was just saying is that, uh, so what you're saying is, I'm trying to understand that science follows where the evidence leads, as Baker has said many times? Yes. Baker has said that, I've heard him say that, and I do agree. Oh. But, uh, uh, but the, the other thing is that, uh, what I don't understand is that, you, you have all these answers like that you know, but uh, no. when, you, when you feel more comfortable like in the Northeast or Northwest instead of in the Bible Belt South, really? 
I, oh, well, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. I, I mean, I, you're, you're, in, you're, in, you're in Bible Belt Redneck country. Uh, you, know, for, the, you, you ate the, you know, atheists. Okay. Wouldn't you feel more Frank, comfortable in the Northeast or Northwest? Frank, I mean, come on. Fr Frank, first of all, I'm, first, somehow or another we jumped topics. You went from an assertion that we... Ha, that we know things, and I, I reject that. The claim you're not claiming, and then you went to, wouldn't we be more comfortable in the Northeast? Yeah, um, what's that? and and we're in the Bible Belt redneck area. Well, first of all, uh, you don't have the first clue what Austin is, uh, because Austin is this liberal bastion. Um, it's not Texas. Second of all, it's not in Texas. It's in it's Tex the of Texas. So now. Frank, 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 I said Austin, Frank, Frank. you're, you, you, you're Please, being so, stop, stop, yeah. everybody stop, it's a problem with the phones, yeah, Frank, I said Austin is not Texas, do you understand um, kind of metaphoric, hyperbolic language, what I mean is your typical view of Texas being the uh, red state Bible Belt thing. That's not what Austin is. Austin is the liberal let's smoke weed and get naked town. It is the let's <laughs> let's keep Austin weird town. It is not. I'm simply saying that where I live is not where you imagine that I live. But second of all, how dare you insult rednecks as an actual redneck uh, to some extent? Uh, I'm very comfortable where I am. By the way, <laughs> boots. Yeah. yeah, got my boots on. And, and in any event, what's it got to do with anything? And if, you know? yeah, this entire conversation about where we live, what the hell does it have to do with anything? Yes. Yeah, so you know, you know where I'd rather live? Drift. You know where I'd rather live? I'd rather live in a world where people base their ideas and their beliefs on evidence and make an effort to actually understand a subject before they call in to show that they don't know what they're talking about. Please don't let hominem attacks, sir. Please. We're no, not. No, no, no. Attacks. Listen, listen here, Frank. That was not an ad hominem, ad hominem attack. Ad hominem. Yeah, it was not an ad hominem attack. It was talking about what kind of world I would actually live in. It was honest. And you're the one who's sitting here talking about where we'd prefer to live and redneck this. Um, by the I way, that as a slur. Again, by the way, semantics. We by the way, by the by, by the way, another telephone problem. Again. An ad hominem fallacy is a problem. An ad hominem attack is not a problem. If somebody's a dumbass and I say they're a dumbass and they don't like it, that's too bad. I'm offering my opinion about what they're saying. I'm not assessing their entire character. I am a dumbass on certain things at certain times. I'm a moron, an idiot, a fool. And so I will also acknowledge that not only am I these things, but other people no, are too. No, that's not, to say it ain't so, please. Okay. Saving, so seriously. Uh, goodbye. Thanks for calling. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for wasting so much time to tell us that we could have lived in the Northeast. Yeah. Uh, by really the way, if you go out and, if yeah. you go out and do a search, you can find uh, towns in the United States listed or cities in the United States listed by their religiosity. There's been some new studies coming out. I think Austin is like uh, in the in the middle of the pack of the top 50 or or, or something. Is yeah, we're good? we're about half. I saw 20, that. We're about halfway down. 20, 30, and something like that. Yeah. So I don't know, um, but yeah, it's I I have no problem at all with uh, living around a bunch of rednecks, even though I don't. Um, mm -hmm. I, d I wouldn't necessarily prefer living where I'd have to shovel snow. Um, That's a thing. Yeah. Uh, I also don't think that reason should be limited to little pockets. I think we should spread it out. I'd like to actually live where education and reason is most needed. I think that's probably a good thing. Yeah. I'd like to be your next door neighbor, Frank, <laughs> because nobody <laughs> needs... Well, that I might mean, work you, you, you jumped topics about 83 times uh, and ended oh, up Oh, is that with, a precise number? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and then ended up with, wouldn't we rather live somewhere else? No. Maybe not. No. All right, Isaac in Venice, thanks for waiting. Hey, thank you. Um, I've watched quite a bit on YouTube. Hang, hang on, I put you on hold. If you're watching uh, the live stream and everything, you're going to need to turn that off or down because we're getting feedback. Okay. Okay, let me turn the game on. Okay. And, and can the call screeners just tell people to do that by default? I'm sure you did, but... How's that now? Much better. Much better, thanks. 
Okay, um, I watched the show on YouTube. I'm a first time caller, and I'm getting a lot of echoing in the phone, so that's throwing me off a bit. But uh, let me just ask a quick question: How do you deal with um, claims of the paranormal, and have you ever experienced anything like that? Um, okay, wow, that's that's different from what it said we were going to talk about, but. Um, so I just did a talk at the North Texas Secular Student Conference a little bit about testability and about claims of the paranormal. The James Randi Educational Foundation has a million dollar prize offered to anybody who can demonstrate a paranormal slash supernatural phenomenon. There's a difference between the phenomenon that manifests and the cause for the phenomenon. So uh, it's, it's one of those things of, uh, let's say that I claim that I have this supernatural ability to predict a die roll. So the odds are one in six of any specific number coming up. And I can predict the die roll 90% of the time um, over really long strings of rolls. That's something that we would, we would look at as uh, extraordinary. And so the first thing you need to do is find out whether or not the phenomenon that I'm claiming exists actually exists. You have to do that in order to demonstrate that there's anything there to investigate to determine a cause. So far... Nobody's been able to demonstrate any phenomenon for anything paranormal or supernatural to the point where we could then begin to investigate the cause. Now, the second problem with that is I'm not convinced that you could ever identify a supernatural cause for a phenomenon because I don't see that they're falsifiable. You may be able to demonstrate a, a, a positive uh, you know, link between things, but by and large, the assertion that there's some supernatural agent or agency or uh, cause is something that I don't see as falsifiable, so I don't know how you'd actually demonstrate it. What you'd end up with, in most cases, is an unknown. There's some extraordinary phenomenon we've demonstrated that is actually occurring. We don't know what causes it. Yeah, and I would go, uh, um, I would add to that by saying that First off, I've never really had a clear definition of, uh, from people who believe in this sort of thing um, of what the word supernatural actually means. Uh, in the same way that I, uh, I speak to people who use words like spiritual, and I ask can them I what that... Can offer yeah, a yeah, definition? Yeah, well, hang on. Well, hang on. Well, well, you can. Let me just go ahead and finish my point real quick, though. Okay. Uh, but um, building on what Matt said, what I, what I would uh, say is that if we ever encountered evidence of what is uh, what people commonly refer to as a supernatural entity, let's say ghosts, right? Let's say that we come down with some really hard evidence of ghosts. Like it's, it's, it's very, you know, you can confirm it. You, we, we can get repeatable results. Uh, there's ghosts. They're really there. We've, we've got one. Um, it's, it's solid. Well, that would not be scientific evidence of the supernatural. What that would mean is that there is something else new. There is something new about our natural world that we now know about. For example, ghosts would be become something, uh, they would become part of our natural world. They would become an undiscovered part of nature Possibly. that we have now discovered. Um, well, in the same way that, um, you know, really extreme ideas in physics and, and cosmology and, and if you go into deep into the universe where you have quarks and gluons and talking about multi-dimensions and what have you and all this speculative science and again these are not, these would have seemed baffling magical concepts to people 200 years ago but there they're, they're are new things that we are discovering in nature it's but, a it's a yeah. little it's a little different from that I mean yeah. there there are the proposed phenomenon mm -hmm. are things that that's why I was saying we would just have an unknown, that we don't know what the cause is. They wouldn't just be, it would be wrong to just say, oh, they're just natural. So, for example, well, if somebody, if somebody of claims... the natural universe, I would... Well, no, the phenomenon is. The yeah. phenomenon manifests, but the cause I mean, being supernatural. Unless, Go ahead. Unless the phenomenon acted with uh, what would seem to be intent or some sort of intelligence. Which still doesn't confirm that it's supernatural. Yeah, because natural things act with intent. So what you would well, have what to. Would you term that as? Well, I don't know. I need an example of what you're what you're talking about because I've never. Okay, I've well, not only I'm never. Pull, I'm pulling out of thin air. Well, okay, that's. How about something? <laughs> how about something moving? Um. That should not be moving in a room. Um. That has no reason to be moving. No physical reason to be moving. How do you know? How do you know that it has no physical reason to be moving? 
on that the example I'm giving. Well, I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is you're, you're making a claim that you, you can't demonstrate. See, okay, well, they look on a coffee table, so flying across the coffee table. Sure. How did you eliminate all possible physical natural causes for that book moving? Because there are no other known possibilities. No, 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 that's a fallacy. Saying there's no other known possibilities is an appeal to ignorance, that we don't know, any, we don't know of any explanation for it, therefore we're justified in going after supernatural. That's, that is an... I haven't, I've never used the word supernatural. Well, okay... Well, but you're, but, you're just hang, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on, because now I'm frustrated. I don't care what word you used. You just said there are no natural causes, which means you're appealing to supernatural causes, correct? I said there's no reason. No, you said no uh, natural reason all right. we know of. Sure. No reason that we know of. So congratulations. Now we have some. Now, now we don't know. So I'm asking you, as my, my first question was, how would you process an event like that? Well, it depends on what the event is. In that specific case, we'd want to actually duplicate it and investigate it and look for natural causes. If, okay. we, don't, if we don't find any, that doesn't mean there aren't any. Okay, let me conclude this call with this. Then, uh, Have you ever seen any of the shows where they seem to have caught events like that on tape? Uh, y yes, they're yeah. disgustingly stupid shows. Do you think that they make those up? Um, yeah, I think no. some of them have been uh, invented as... You know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, okay, uh, stop. I didn't say I know. You asked me what my opinion was, and I gave you my opinion, okay. and I did not claim to know. I am convinced that some of them are faked because we know that faking like that happens. We've caught people faking these things before. I cannot sure. make that claim for all of them or any specific one, but they have not demonstrated an actual phenomenon sufficiently to justify believing it, and they still haven't and possibly could never demonstrate that it's caused by something supernatural. See, here are the options that you would be, here, here are the options that you would be faced with, Isaac, if, if, for example, let's say I'm watching this video and I see some phenomenon occur, okay? There are numerous options. Number one, a genuinely paranormal supernatural phenomenon is being recorded and I'm watching it on tape right now. That's one option. Another option is that the producers of the show uh, have faked this uh, just for the entertainment value of the show. Uh, my opinion, my, op my opinion, well, hang on, hold it, hold it. Hey, hang hey, on. I'm, I'm explaining why, why that's an opinion that I would have, okay? <laughs> the reason that I think that that's possible you is because... You can listen offline. Go ahead. The reason that I think it's possible that some of these could be faked is because I work professionally in film and television. I have worked on reality shows. I have seen spontaneous events. I have been on set when these have been staged by the producer. You know, the producer will come in and they'll say, talk about this, do this, you get in an argument with this person, let's pitch this scene up, people. I mean, they'll say that, right? And then it's all shot, and you're supposed to sit there at home thinking you're watching reality. So I know that if this is going on with dating shows and with, uh, you know, summer break shows and what have you, do I think that there's absolutely no faking anywhere that goes on with these ghost investigation shows? Well, no, of course not. So there, so there is a very likely, there's a very strong likelihood that that's going on. Secondly, what we have, what we're, could be, uh, secondly, I'm on to my third now. Third possibility is that we are simply witnessing a natural phenomenon that doesn't have an immediately good explanation or that we don't know the explanation for and it's simply being interpreted through the filters of the people doing the show in such a way to make it seem supernatural. This is a thing called confirmation bias. If you go to a haunted house with a bunch of video cameras and equipment and you're damn determined to find a ghost, guess what? You're going to be finding ghosts all night. They're going to be dancing through the halls. You're going to hear a shutter bang and go, there's a ghost. You're going to hear a pipe creak and go, there's a ghost. You're going to hear a mouse in the, uh, in the walls and go, there's a mouse ghost. You know, you, you, people, who, people who produce these, these shows are people who want there to be ghosts. So there's all kinds of bias that you have to rule out, all kinds of options that you have to examine before you can cut through that and say, nope, real ghosts this time. So yes, there are many, many things you can consider. You can't just watch a tape, say, hmm, that's a strange phenomenon, and go right to thinking that the supernatural is real, if you're going to be rational about it. There's a, difference, there's a difference between demonstrating the phenomenon and demonstrating a cause. And the cause is difficult and maybe impossible when you're talking about the supernatural. Not knowing, not having an explanation, means that your answer is, I don't know. Yeah. That, that's the answer. Yeah. And by the way, to kind of angle off of Martin's thing with regard to TV, um, 
you know those shows is like Will they find the Loch Ness Monster this week? No, because it was filmed six months ago, and if there was anything real to it, it <laughs> yeah. would have been news everywhere. We wouldn't have had to wait for the advertisement for this show. Yeah. And there wouldn't be 93 ghost hunter medium shows, none of which have seemed to apply for the million-dollar yeah. prize. or anything. There's, there's, Yeah. TV is not the source for good information about all sorts of things. <laughs> if it is your only source and your primary source, chances are you are not justified in believing <laughs> yeah. it. Especially yeah. if it's on like true TV. Yeah. Uh, or the history channel. Yes. The history channel is the, probably the biggest abomination in the history yeah. of television because it portrays yeah. it, along with some of the other science channels, have gone kind of off the deep end. Yeah. I've At least some of the ghost hunter craps on sci fi where they, they're hoping. Yeah. It reminds me of the the uh, the, the old nine hundred call a psychic things, and at the bottom, yes. it's, you know, for amusement purposes only. That's um, what it is. It's people are going to believe what they're going to. It's believe. TV. It's an entertainment industry. Yeah. Now, but I'll wrap up by saying, would I like to someday meet a ghost or some kind of? See, would it be cool? Well, sure it would, but yeah, you know, I'm not going to be haunting these ghost hunter shows, you know, hoping. You know, Marcus in the Bible Belt of Colorado. How are you? Hey, you're on the air, Marcus. Hello. I don't think you can hear Hello. us. Oh, J. Mark. Oh, hang on, I did, hit the wrong one. Marcus, now you're on the air. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we're good. That Thanks. was my fault. Okay, not a problem. Um, well, no, I want to say first of all, uh, I really appreciate the show that you guys have every week. I watch it as much as I can. Thanks. And you know, I just sort of quote unquote came out the closet uh, being an atheist uh, within the past three months. Well, welcome yeah. to the to the dark side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we have and, cookies. And honestly, before I honestly, honestly feel like my experience was almost that of like let's say the Matrix, analogous to the Matrix, where Neil takes the red pill and he came into reality. Mm -hmm. And so now I have a YouTube channel and it's take the red pill because of that. <laughs> cool. cool. Well, good for you. Yeah, well, here's a question I wanted to ask. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about, like, let's say the Adam and Eve story, in which they, you know, I told them that, well, God said, of the day you eat the fruit, you shall surely die. Mm -hmm. And people will turn around and try to give me the excuse that it was spiritual death. Mm -hmm. Now, um, um, Matt, I know that you've done a lot of studying with the Bible, and Martin, I'm sure you have as well. And I personally have studied the Bible, and I have never come across any verses or reference that would suggest it was spiritual death. And I just was wondering, what is your take on that? Um, I think it's a post hoc rationalization, but I don't care. It doesn't matter. None of it happened. And whether it was a real death or a spiritual death, it's still a story. And it's still patently absurd. Don't eat this fruit or you'll get knowledge of good and evil. Uh, don't eat this fruit or you'll live forever. You know, if you eat this fruit, you're, on the day you eat it, you'll surely die. Um, up until recently, uh, you know, the, no, well, that's not true. I don't, it doesn't matter to me how they want to interpret it. It doesn't change how absurd it is. I have no way of knowing whether the original author was stupid enough to both simultaneously mean that they were going to die on that day and then write that they kept on living. Um, or whether the original author, this is partly where they get this from, uh, had another meaning that we, we don't understand or that we didn't understand. Um, because it's, it's, it's stupid to say, on the day you eat it, you'll die, and then the next day you're alive. Because if there, there were certain apologetics that said, well, God changed his mind and decided not to kill them. And then there are others that say it's a spiritual wow. death. And I don't care because um, it's yeah. not true. Uh, apologists have this, uh, this word called hermeneutics, which is a $20 word that means spin. Yeah. Which is every time, you know, you, it, it's, every time that you uh, point something out in the Bible that's absurd or contradictory or that just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, they'll say, oh, well, you're not interpreting the Bible properly. And by this, they hope to sort of catch you out and say, oh, well, you poor fellow, of course, you haven't simply studied God's word as much as you should. And the more you study God's word and be a loyal, believing Christian, et cetera, et cetera, you will come into this knowledge. Da, da, da. Right. What they are forgetting, uh, what they're not really addressing is, you know, if John 3.16 is true, if God so loved us, he wanted to, uh, all to be saved and living with him in paradise and heaven forever, why 
did he arrange to have his holy book, the document in which his word is made manifest unto man, be this confused mishmash of texts ranging several centuries, cobbled together by several more centuries of ecclesiastical arguing and editing and rewriting and uh, re-editing and re-rewriting and re-re-editing, which at the end of the day has to be interpreted all to hell and back to make any sense at all. Why would an all-powerful being need this book that requires wild interpretation to be understood? I, I think, why, why, I think the appeal to the Bible is yeah. probably one of the biggest demonstrations that the Christian God does not and could not exist yeah. um, because uh, they, they give him credit for a particular wisdom and sagacity that yeah. is betrayed by not only the character in the Bible, but the fact that the Bible exists at all. The fact that the, a, a being of that much intelligence would choose to convey the most important message in a medium like text in ancient languages or in languages that he knows are going to die off and, and be difficult interpreting. It is, they, think, they think their God is so just bizarrely stupid. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'd prefer a God that was intelligent. Yeah. I definitely agree. Hey, could I ask you one other quick question? Sure. Okay, um, we're, we're trying to get something set up almost like the way you guys do over there uh, in the ACA because we think it's awesome. And what would you suggest, like, my, I'll, you know, I go research on my first step into impl uh, implementing that? To get a group or the TV show or what? Well, I'm sorry, yeah, TV show. Um, you need to find out whether or not you've got public access TV in your area and what the restrictions are because public access TV is dying. And not all of them allow you to do live shows. Not all of them allow you to take live calls. Um, but you know, you don't even need it anymore because nowadays we have uh, that's we, where we have going. Google. I'm sorry, we have. That's all right. Okay, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I mean, that's where that was the next. You thing were going there. Well, you know, we just great minds, right? Yeah, you can just uh, yeah. do it online. Uh, you got podcasts. You've got Google Hangouts. You've got uh, web TV. Um, I just, you know, um, last week there's a there's a wonderful show out of uh, the UK, Trolling with Logic, who who kind of do what we do. Um, so it's uh, you, you can do all this what we do here online. Start 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 free and cheap. Yeah. Or, or start as cheap cheaply as possible. Get a webcam. Find out some people who are interested. Give it a go. See if you got an audience. Uh, see if there's interest. Um, and if you just want to meet and hook up with other atheists in your area too, the way to just start that is through uh, meetups and social hangouts. Uh, you know, oh, you're... trust me, I've started that already. Oh, and good, yeah. Okay. We're, we're spreading pretty fast. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's there's already. I was just up in in Denver not too long ago. There's a pretty good atheist community in Colorado Springs, and I find that that's the case everywhere. You, the, the more deeply inside of the Bible Belt and at its buckles and studs that you get. Right. The uh, <laughs> the more atheist and the more vocal the atheist groups are. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks, thanks for calling, you. Marcus. Really appreciate you. Yeah, cool. yeah. We really appreciate the call. All right. All right. And Ronald in Indianapolis. Oh, how are you doing? Pretty good. Just fine. Um, wonderful show. Uh, I've got to give my place to you guys. And um, I had a question about what was your opinion on meditation. What's going on? Is this Ronald? Yes, this is Ronald. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah no, yeah. no. I am just confused because all day long, the, yeah. the, the We've, topic listed has been completely different from what the people are talking about when they get on the air. But that's okay. You know, if you want to. Well, I'm, I'm just adding that. I mean, I, I can okay. explain my position, but you've had so much no. uh, going on with uh, your conversations with other callers that I'm trying to yeah, it was slow just, things down a little bit and it was know, just, let you guys breathe. <laughs> yeah, it's just weird here because it says the universe was created by a scientific process, not a God process. And, yes. and, and uh, okay, so far as we can tell, it's a definitely a uh, naturalistic process and we don't have any reason to assert a God. Uh, so cool, I agree, we're done with that. Uh, <laughs> meditation, um, there, I, I think it's pretty clear that there have been demonstrated um, some real benefits to meditation, but that none of this actually requires any appeal to the supernatural. Yeah, I, I have things that I do to put myself in a calming state, and so I, you, you know, and uh, I do too. It's called. It's just a problem with the phone. It's just a problem <laughs> with the phone. <laughs> I know. He said, uh, you, "You've been very good today." By I'm trying. Uh, been very zen. Well, so yeah, I mean, you know, but it's it. That's you know, we, we are we are beings with a wide range of emotions that we experience all the time, and so yeah, those are good things to have, but they don't have to be. Uh, I, I think what some demonic. people have done yeah. um, with things like meditation. Um, 
you know, and I don't want to call it placebo effect and stuff like that because, I, you know, as far as I can tell, there are real benefits. And I think what some people have done is said, hey, this is good and I don't know how it works. And then they add a whole bunch of crap to it mm-hmm. um, and entirely unjustified. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the snake oil salesman that, you know, it's going to mm-hmm. sell you a cure-all, and maybe it's got aspirin in it, so it actually yeah. works for something. And uh, no, 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 this is awesome, and it'll grow your limbs back, mm-hmm. and you know, it just I, won't. I think it's an example of the same kind of confirmation bias that I was just talking about uh, yeah. with our previous caller, where you know, if you are someone who believes in a loving God, if you are someone who believes in nirvana, if you are someone who believes mm-hmm. that you have chakras, and, and you know, whatever thing that you do in your life that puts you in a, an emotionally uh, stable and comfortable place, uh, you'll, you'll attribute that to those things. There's a lot of this that comes down to, hey, wouldn't it be cool if, very quickly, for some people, turns into, oh, this is true. And it 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 begins with these ideas that there is a, uh, because we each have our own subjective experience within reality, that, that therefore we have something that's, well, it's true for me. No, 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 there's, there's truth. But this true for me thing goes, uh, you see it with the what the bleep do we know and everything else where we we are inventing the reality that we're in people have taken it you know to that extent and it's just it's just bizarre and none of it holds up and so we may be crippling um, the discovery of good and real things you know it's like I, I pointed out before that prayer can have benefits uh, and in and, and prayer can have benefits similar to meditation it would be nice to investigate that and figure out what we can find out about the cause as best we can, or at least exactly how to consistently replicate the results and what what areas they're effective and when they're not, rather than adding a whole bunch of uh, baggage, which should probably just be called garbage to it. Well, I understand what you're saying and, and what I was saying relates to my studies of all of that stuff. I'm not gonna get into it. I don't want your eyes roll back in your head. But uh, my, as an atheist, my biggest issue with arguing, especially with Christians or other religious people, is where the, the, the birth of the universe. And I've worked for years in trying to, to, to really hone down an argument to explain how the universe itself is born without a God mechanism. And I think I have, the, I have that argument down. All yeah, that kind of led me to the, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to say something? Uh, I was just going to say you can't. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. The, cl- the, 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 the claim is that the universe began without a God mechanism. You can't make that yeah. claim because it's an unfalsifiable claim. Um, it could be, and, and, the, and the response from the theist is God works, you know, through natural means. You can't, mm-hmm. di- you can't disprove, you can't prove that there wasn't a God actually uh, tinkering and using natural means. So, I mean, it's, you got to be very careful about how you frame some of those things because you end up with, an indefensible position. Yeah, the best the best thing to say, and really all you need to say, is that we do not have any reason to suppose that a god would have been necessary. Yeah, a violation because, of Occam's razor, whatever. Yeah, you know, but... Right, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so please go on. Well, uh, the way I look at it, though, is when you take the, you say, quantum entanglement and vacuum energy and the, like, that was said experiments, it's my belief that it's these phenomena that people haven't really looked at tying together as a causality for the universe. I think the universe has left clues to how it essentially replicates itself. And I think it's looking at the overall, you know, examples that are left that are basically what we look at in scientific history because scientists really don't understand the why behind these things. And that's where my studies have come in is to say, when you, when you ask the question, what is consciousness, really the truth of consciousness, consciousness, it only really has four choices. And you could call that a qubit, essentially, which is yes, no, both, and neither. And all the conscious choices we make as human beings are based around that. And when I say you can have two simultaneous states at the same time as a human being, of course, you know, I'm sure you've, you've laughed so hard, you've cried, that's occupying the no, it's not. Way of li- I'm sorry. No, it's not. Uh, well, uh, okay. Well, then, well, how do you see that then? Well, what, what you, to the extent that I understand what you've done, because you went off in all kinds of directions, and as soon as people start throwing out quantum, um, <laughs> I, I just like have to 
swallow the vomit. Um, because it's, it's because it's used because it's because it's used for so much confusion. You just you yeah. just said yes, no, both, neither. That's not that's a violation of the logical absolutes. This is a category mistake to say that you're in in you know to to go to to human reactions and say you laugh till you you laugh till you cry. So you're simultaneously in in a laugh state and a cry state. Well, those two states aren't mutually exclusive. It, the, the, the contradiction would be to both in a laugh state and not in a laugh state. That is a true dichotomy. Laugh and cry is not a true dichotomy. And so this is where people get confused. They think that the logical absolutes, oh, they think true and false is a true dichotomy. True and false is not a true dichotomy. True and not true is the dichotomy. True and false only applies to statements whose truth value can be assessed. And so a statement is either true or not true. There is no both or neither. That's the Well, then my question is, um, since we're there, how do you view that uh, science, scientists have witnessed uh, particles either in a simultaneous state or two different states? Because uh, we're occupying the same state, if you will. Because because those are not true dichotomies. They, I get this all the time when I talk about the logical absolutes. People email in and say, "Well, what about you know quantum physics, where something's you know uh, in one state and in another state?" Okay, something can be in multiple states. The fact that what, what you the, the problem is that something can't be in a state and not in that state at the same time in the same way. And when, we, when we've observed things that appear to be this, this way, it's come down to our inability to accurately understand and model this. It's not a violation of the laws uh, of thought. And, and actually the laws of thought, are, they're, just, they're, they're truisms. They're not something that you would violate. They're not prescriptive laws. Um, but now we're, man, we are way out there. And there's one more call I want to get to. And there's only like two minutes left on the yeah. show. So we'll, we'll have to hold, save it for another time. Okay. okay, sounds good. But thank we do you. we do appreciate the call, yeah. man. Thanks. All right, thank you. There are people whose ears were bleeding already well, from tag and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Cameron, we've only got about a minute left, so if you can get to your question really quick, I'd appreciate it. If not, we'll have to take it on another show. Okay. Uh, well, I was basically just calling in to find out, you know, what's your standpoint in, in, in beliefs, basically. Like, what do you believe? I believe uh, me personally. I'm a born again Christian. Yeah, I, I used to be one of those. I don't believe that anymore, but I believe many of the same things I've always believed. And what is that? Um, it's it's why well, it's hard to say because I, I don't know what you know. I believe that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. I believe that the the Earth orbits the Sun. The, the things yeah. about facts, stuff like that. But that's not what you're asking. Yeah, I think um, I, I I I believe. Oh, sorry, we are completely out of time. Uh. Well, I got I to gotta let you go. Send an email to tv at atheist-community.org or call back in next week uh, sometime before the show's yeah, over. Try to get a more detailed answers to you. If I, you and and if you hang on, yeah. I'll take this after the show's over. Thanks. Okay. We'll be back next week. Um, <laughs> Thanks, bye -bye. everyone. So long. <laughs> uh, and sorry to the callers we didn't get to.